Shabbat Shalom. Today, uh, I'm going to have a bit of a teaching uh, message. So if you'd like to uh, write down things, uh, it might be a good time to do so. Today's message is called Showdown at the Sea. You know, there's a, there's a poem uh, about the Red Sea crossing. It says, and it's an anonymous author, we don't know who wrote it. It says, when Moses and his people from Egypt's land did flee, their enemies behind them and in front of them the sea, God raised the waters like a wall and opened up the way. And the God who lived in Moses' time is just the same today. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 14, we heard this read. You know, Pharaoh comes after the children of Israel with the mightiest of his army, his 600 choice chariots, and then all the chariots of Egypt. So lots of chariots and horses, spears, swords, army men of Egypt that were chasing them. Pharaoh changed his mind. Gee, how unlike him. So, the people are griping against Moses now, right? They say to him, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you treated us this way to bring us out of Egypt? Isn't it the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses' response to them is very impactful. He says in Exodus 14, verse 13, he says to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand still. Be still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For you will never again see the Egyptians whom you have seen today. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall be still. Moses says in Exodus 14, verse 13, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The salvation of the Lord. In the Hebrew text here, uh, the word for salvation here in Exodus 14, verse 13 is Yeshua. Yeshua is the masculine form of the feminine noun for salvation. Yeshua is feminine. Yeshua is masculine. Psalm 118 says, He will become my salvation, my Yeshua. In Matthew 121, when Miriam was carrying the unborn Messiah, the child within her, an angel told her husband Joseph, you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save my, his people from their sins. Now, the apostles in the Greek manuscripts, they use the Greek word archegos uh, to describe Yeshua. Hebrews 2 verse 10 says, For it was fitting for him for whom all are, are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of, Archegos of their salvation through sufferings. And in Acts 3.15, Peter refers to Yeshua as the Archegos of life, the author of life. It also means leader or, or the, uh, the pioneer, the first. And as we look here at these the culmination of some of the most glorious miracles that ever appeared in the books of, the, of Moses, we see that the first Redeemer, Moses, is like the last Redeemer, the Messiah. Moses splits the sea and walks right through it, a dry land, no less. But Yeshua calms the sea and walks over it. Messiah walked above the water just as in the creation in Genesis 1. The spirit hovered over the surface of the water. The ancient sages of Israel said that that spirit that hovered over the water is the Messiah. 
This helps us to understand how Messiah then is superior to Moses. Hebrews 3 verses 5 and 6 teaches us that Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Messiah is faithful as a son over his house. After the miracle of splitting the sea when Israel passed through and the Egyptians in pursuit were drowned, Moses leads Israel in a song of praise to God. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit here about immersion. Some of you not familiar with that term, baptism. Immersion, to submerse underwater or within water. Exodus 15, verses 1 and 2 says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has thrown the horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation, Yeshua. Hebrews 11.29 says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. John the Immerser, John the Baptist, in Matthew 3 verse 11 says, As for me, I immerse you in water for repentance. But the one coming after me is mightier than I am. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were immersed. They were baptized. Oh, but they got the baptism of water, but not fire. Really? Take a look at the word again in Exodus. What was with them the whole time? A pillar of fire was in front of them. When the Egyptian army came, the pillar of fire moved behind them to block the way of the Egyptians as the sea opened and Israel crossed through. Once Israel had gotten probably to the other side, then the pillar of fire moved back again in front of them on the other side of what was called the Yam Suf or the Red Sea, Sea of Reeds or Reed Sea. However you want to read it. <laughs> in Exodus 14, uh, in, in uh, 21 to 22 says, Then Moses, he stretched out his hand over the sea. And Adonai drove the sea back with a strong east wind an east wind throughout the night and turned the sea into dry land so that the waters were key word here divided the waters were divided and then the children of israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground while the waters were like walls to them on their right and on their left walls the section that they pass through, by the way, which I don't really go into in my message today, uh, was by the Gulf of Aqaba. And the Gulf of Aqaba, which is where uh, they've had divers that have gone down there and found human remains, uh, uh, swords, shields, uh, chariot wheels in that area of the Sea of Reeds, in the Gulf of Aqaba. And that, the, the, uh, it's about 300 feet deep. So they talk about a wall of water, 300 feet high. That's a wall. It's not a wall that you, you know, step over. It's a wall of water. Now the Hebrew word here used for the word divided at the end of verse 21, there's a, a word, remember we said that so the waters were divided. The Hebrew word here, which is important, is baka. It's not baka like Spanish for cow. It's baka. And baka it, it here is used for divided, but that's in Exodus 14. But when we look back in Genesis chapter 1, it says, God said, let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. There was another division being made. But the Hebrew root word here used for divide in Genesis 1 is badal. It is from this word, by the way, that the... Uh, that the Jewish ceremony of Havdalah is derived for dividing the secular uh, uh, from the from the holy time to the secular time. 
Badal means to, to divide. But the word used for parting the Red Sea is Baka, is, is a much more dramatic Hebrew word than Badal. Baka signals the divine intervention into a scene of disorder. See, in Genesis, God is creating the world. So it's not, it's not disorder there, it's he's doing the creation. But, you know, you come ahead thousands of years and you have disorder created by mankind. And so he comes in with order in the midst of disorder and he divides order from disorder, water from water, bad guys from good guys. The parallels to the creation in Genesis and also the plagues of Egypt, however, are very prominent here in Exodus 14. For example, the sea is divided by that strong east wind. The same Hebrew words used when Adonai brought the locusts with an east wind in Exodus 10 verse 13. East wind in Hebrew is Ruach Kadim. Everybody say Ruach Kadim. Ruach Kadim. Which could also be translated as instead of a strong east wind, could be spirit of the east. Breath of the east, as well as the familiar wind of the east or east wind. But it is the spirit of the east that intrigues me. But that's another sermon. There is a Hasidic story, an incredible true account about the reading of Exodus 15, the song of the sea. While being one with the Ruach, the spirit of God, once, Rabbi Schmelke of Nicholsburg said the song at the sea as a prayer leader with such holy power that when the congregation recited with him the verses about the crossing of the Red Sea, they all lifted up the hands of their kaftans. It's like long robes that Orthodox Jews wore in those days and some of them still wear today. And they lifted up the hems of their kaftans to keep them from getting wet. For it actually seemed to them that they had gone down into the sea, which had split before them. Imagine a prayer so powerful that in reciting the verses from Exodus 15, the song at the sea, that you felt your own feet, your socks were damp. Moses and Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. I do not doubt the word of the living God. He says it was dry. I believe it was dry. Well, there was commentators that said it was mud, and the Egyptians were getting stuck in the mud. What mud? It says dry ground. I believe God. Amen. Not Joe Schmuckatelli from the university. <laughs> Each of us today face our own Red Sea crossing, people. Our own Red Sea showdown, if you will. Many times in our walk with God, you know, we are new creations in the Messiah, having been reborn and being under the blood of Yeshua. But however, there are times in our lives when we, we like the children of Israel, face a Red Sea crossing, a Red Sea showdown. Have you ever found yourself in a desperate situation? Desperate, absolutely desperate, don't know what to do. You ever felt that you were painted into a corner? Did it seem that there was like no way out? Have you ever felt like you were between a rock and a hard place? Financial problems, family problems, health crisis, faith faltering, hope halted, victory vanished. We see here in Exodus 14, that this is the case with the children of Israel. They find themselves in a desperate situation. They're trapped with nowhere to turn. There seems to be no way out. They're caught between Pharaoh and the Red Sea. And you know, when I was reading the text, suddenly, some child of the 70s, born in the in 61, so by the 70s, I was hearing the music of the time, and the Vietnam War was raging. And... Um, I had thought about what kind of Moses we would know if Moses was from the 1970s in America. And in 1973, a song called Stuck in the Middle with You was released by a group called Steeler's Wheel. And in the song, in the song are repeated a uh, chorus of lyrics and which says, clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I am stuck in the middle with you. 
And I'm thinking about Moses' version of those lyrics as he is between the Red Sea on one side, Pharaoh with his chariots racing toward him on the other side, and in the middle, a bunch of frightened and grumbling Hebrews complaining against him. And he might have sung something like this. Pharaoh to the left of me, the sea to the right, here I am stuck in the middle with you. Now where's he going to go? Well, he has to lead Israel. They're complaining. Pharaoh's charging. The ocean's raising. Stuck in the middle. And there are several things that we need to do that will indeed enable us to cross the Red Seas in our own lives. When we come to that Red Sea showdown, when we come to that point that we don't know what to do, we face a crisis that it seems no way out of. The first thing we have to do, the very first thing is to let go of the past. Let go of the past. When Moses and God's people arrived at the shores of the Red Sea, they could see the Egyptians rapidly approaching them. I want you to think about that. You've got nowhere to go. You're just walking through the desert. You come upon the sea. You can't swim. It's not like they were giving uh, swimming lessons to the slaves of Egypt. They can't swim. It's either jump in the water and die or let them kill you. It's like, Moses, why did you bring us here? We could have stayed in Egypt. They thought they were trapped. But you see, God had a purpose. They were afraid, according to verse 10, they were very frightened. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, moaning, grumbling, we told you this in Egypt. You should have left us alone. We could have carried on serving the Egyptians. We could have walked like an Egyptian. Okay, I did that last week. So let me tell you something. When you are facing the Red Sea in your own life, there's something you can't get out of, you can't seem to charge, it's a crisis that you just can't pass. And you, um, there's always the temptation to go back to Egypt. It really is. Go back to the way it was. Egypt here represents the world. Now, I knew a, a young lady and uh, years ago in our congregation, and she came in full of uh, curiousness to learn about our style of faith. She was very excited about it. She had a, uh, 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 a young son, and um, she was very into it at first, and uh, well, after some years, she faded away and she left, and then I heard that um, she was returning to a, a uh, of a unbelieving boyfriend from another state out in the West. And she ended up marrying the guy and going back with him, even though she knew it was wrong. And the, re and the way she was with him in the beginning was wrong. And she moved far away from him to follow God. But it was so difficult for her. It was so tough. It was so f financially in every other way. And eventually she gave in. She married the guy and moved back there with him. And she took her son with her. She went back to Egypt. I'm not saying the guy was Egyptian, but she went back to Egypt. You know, she read the word, she said the prayer, she believed, she was fully into it, invested in it. And, but the adversary was putting a block on her in order to, for her to understand trial, difficulty, temptation was there in front of her. All you have to do is go back with money guy over here and your problems are over. And uh, unfortunately for her, she took the bait. And uh, that is not the way we should be. You see, the problem with Israel was they became accustomed to slavery. And I'm sorry to say they were comfortable in it. It was the life they knew. It was the whip they knew. What's the expression, better the devil you know? They thought it would have been better to stay in Egypt as slaves, verse 12. Sometimes we have the tendency to look back where we, where, you know, when we come to the Red Sea in our life. We're always looking back how good it was a few years ago when I had money. How good it was a few years ago when I was with that hot blonde. How good it was some years ago you know, when this happened and I had that job and whatever it was. Before they repossessed my Ferrari, you know, whatever you know, it is in your life. And you're looking back there like that was great instead of being in the now. 
And that's where the adversary jumps right in and starts dangling temptation. I gotta tell you something, and I speak from experience. Our old life will not help us. Our old life will not help us. God has brought us to where we are, made us who we are today for a purpose on our journey with him, our walk with him. There's nothing wrong with memories, but we don't cross the Red Seas in our lives by looking to the past, by looking to our old life before we knew the Lord. The past, our old life, it can't help us. It will not help us. We can never overcome what is in front of us if we keep looking backwards. You can't do it. You gotta face the problem in front of you. You can learn from experience and go forward. You know, in Israel, the IDF, when they charge, they say the Hebrew word, Kadima, forward, let's go. There is no other command they have, charge of battle. It's not, hey, we're going to go ahead and why don't you guys stay here and have a bite to eat, maybe some shawarma. And uh, when we come back, let's see how the battle goes. It's one word. All of us together have to go. It's a little of us and a lot of those guys. Kadima. The Lord has been constantly proving himself to us. You know, he doesn't have to, but he does it. He proves himself to us, taking us through dangers, seen and unseen. What unseen? You know, like that semi-tractor trailer, the jackknife on the other side of the highway that was designed by the adversary to kill you and everybody in your car and take you away from your path of faith. You know, God sent his angels in there to divert that tractor trailer into the trees. You didn't see it. You didn't know it. You never thought it. But God was there. Israel was so paralyzed with fear that they were willing to give up everything, freedom, for a life of despondency and hopelessness. And it amazes me that when things go wrong in a believer's life, the first thing we do is blame the Lord. It's his fault. And sometimes we turn our backs on him because things aren't going the way we wanted it to go. Let me give you an example for my military service. A parachute will not improve your flight. I can tell you right now, it's uncomfortable. It'll be uncomfortable when you're sitting down with that huge thing in your back and another small one, the reserve in the front. But a parachute will save your life when you jump out of that plane. So many times we give up and settle for anything instead of receiving all that God has for us. I can tell you something. You wear a pair of sandals long enough, they're going to start wearing out. When kids are growing, they sometimes have what's called growing pains. And I don't mean that in, in, a, uh, in a metaphoric way. I mean physical pain in their bodies as their, as their bones and bodies expand. They have pain, right? So does the believer. You're tearing away. You're fighting away from that old nature that's saying, get over here. Trying to walk with God. If you're going to walk with the Messiah, you got to use his sandals. Not the sandals that lead to the nightclub. And I'm trying to use modern language, uh, the club. You know, because if I said disco, people start looking around and what I'm talking about. If you're going to cross that Red Sea, you've got to let go of the past. We've got to stop allowing the enemy to convince us to return to the things that God has already brought us out of. What about when I had money? God took you out of that evil. What about when I had that husband? What about when I had that wife? What about when I, all of a sudden, everything back there starts looking good. God already brought you out of that. Stop looking back to what he already has rescued you from. He is your salvation. Amen. God brought the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery. They were there for 430 years under the whip of the Egyptian taskmasters. 
He's brought us out of the bondage of sin by the death and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Romans 12 verse 2 says this. And please, if you don't hear anything else I say, please listen to this word. Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 2, let go of the past and don't look back for your help. Notice in a, a humorous story about a former president President George W. Bush. And it's just a humorous story. And it's in this story, he's uh, one day in an airport. And he's in this airport, and he sees a man in a, in a long beard and long flowing robe holding two big stone tablets. And he looks at this guy in the corner, he looks around, nobody else seems to be bothering about it. So he goes over, you know, his security detail, the Secret Service guys are hanging in the back. And uh, he goes over there and he says, excuse me, um, are you Moses? And uh, uh, the guy turns around. He puts his back on. So the president looks around. What's wrong with him? So he starts making him speak English. And he goes around and he puts himself in front of him there. And he says, uh, excuse me, are you Moses? The guy turns his back on him again. Now, the president can't understand why this guy's being so uppity. So... He now positions himself the third time right in front of him, stands on his tiptoes, as this Moses is very tall, and he says, excuse me, are you Moses? And he says, I'm not talking to you. And he says, why not? And Moses says, because the last time I talked to a bush, I spent 40 years in a desert. <laughs> oh. 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 Now, we got to let go of the past. The next thing we need to do to get through those red seas in our life is to look to your faith. Don't look to the past. Look to your faith. Verses 13 and 14 of Exodus 14. Don't be afraid. The children of Israel were afraid. The Lord God of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe, is right there with you in a pillar of fire. Moses says, the Lord will do battle for you. Stand still. You don't have to do anything. The Lord's going to take care of it. He is your salvation. They're afraid. They're complaining. Don't allow the enemy to keep you in the confinement of fear. In the prison of fear. Fear is not from God. Fear is not from God. In fact, fear is the opposite of faith. Let me explain fear to you. I don't think you really understand what fear is. You think fear is just when you feel afraid? That's not what fear is, not in scripture. Let me, explain, let me break it down for you. F-E-A-R. F-E-A-R is false evidence appearing real. That's what fear is. It's a trick that the enemy will use to keep you entangled and entrapped in his snare. Looking back instead of looking at your faith. God has already rescued you. He's already saved you. Remember. Wars go back and forth, but the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. And our God doesn't lose. He's never known defeat. Amen. Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. This is the World Messianic Bible translation off of Bible.com. It says, for God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Well, the pastor said, the rabbi said, no. God has said through his spirit that he did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Love and power are not opposed to one another. Love is power. It's the greatest powerful force in the universe. It's much more powerful than evil. And faith. What is faith? We think about, oh, I have faith. You have faith. Do you know what you have? Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us about faith. What it is. 
I don't mean like the, the greeting from the 70s, what it is. I mean, what is faith? <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of realities not seen. Can you see faith? Can you grab it? Can you touch it? No, but it is there. Just like the air you breathe. Well, I don't see God and his angels. He's here now. Amen. They're here now. Sitting right next to you, listening to this sermon. You know, some of them, who knows, that guy could have done that a little better. Other ones like, that boy good. Yeah. Anyway, no matter how the adversary tries to plant the device of fear in your spirit, you've got to remember that that's not coming from God. Just stand boldly on God's promises. Stand boldly on God's word and look to your faith. You know, the problem here was that some of the Israelites didn't believe that God would bring them out, wouldn't be, rescue them. He didn't believe, in spite of all he had done for them, in spite of all the plagues that he had put on the Egyptians. They didn't believe that God would see them through. And I love reading about this. It's a great story, the parting of the Red Sea, the song at the sea, the miracles. I love reading about it, and every time I read it, I learn something new. And I've been reading that I don't since I was, what, five, six years old? Since I was first in yeshiva, I've been reading this, and every time there's something new. Every time God speaks something else. I go, God has nothing more to teach me. I've already learned it all. I went to... The best schools. I've learned everything. I've got all these years of experience. And you know, let me just try to do a different style on the sermon. Then I read the text and God's speaking. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, Lord, I hear you. I must have changed my message today. That was going to be three times this week. I'm working on it. I'm going. This is the way I'm going with it. Yeah, this sounds good. Here's what I'm going. I go back to the text just to refresh again. I keep going back to the text. Read through Exodus, read through the prophet, read through the New Covenant a little bit that pertains to that section, and I'm reading it, and a big red stop sign pops up in my face. No, that is not what I want you to say this week. That's not what the people need right now. What do you mean, Lord? I just spent three days working on this. I go on all the notes. The sermon's practically done. Please print it out so that it will be more in order when you throw it in the trash and work on the one that I have. Okay, Lord, you're the boss. Start working on another one. Almost finished with my second sermon. Okay, it's Thursday morning. Read the text again. Big stop sign. No. Nope. How could this not? This is a great sermon. This is great. This is awesome. And God says, no, I'm awesome. Your message is flat. That's not what I want you to teach this week. So I naturally did what every Jewish man would do. I went to the bathroom, got a Q-tip, cleaned my ears. So I'm sure I heard wrong. Came back to the text, and sure enough, that sermon was no good. Worked on sermon one, no good. Worked on sermon two, no good. I can't believe this. It's Thursday, the beginning of the afternoon. I just picked up my son from school, and I'm going to work on a new sermon on Thursday? What am I and that's when God started revealing to me what he wanted to say. Not only to talk about how God rescued the children of Israel from the Egyptians that were pursuing them. Not only his miracle parting the sea. Not only the joyful song that Moses and Israel sang to him, which is so beautiful. But he wants me to talk about how he is your savior today now. That he's going to part the Red Sea in your life for you. That he's going to be there to save you. That he's going to be there to rescue you. That, he, that you're going to have trials and difficulties in your life. But he's going to take care of that for you. He's taking you through that for a purpose. To strengthen you. To build you up. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 43 verse 2. He says... When you pass through water, I will be with you. When you pass through water, I will be with you. When you pass through rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be scorched. 
the flame will not burn you. I will be with you. All of us are going to experience a time when we need to be rescued. I don't care who you are. You might think you're Sir Lancelot, right? You're Leonardo DiCaprio playing the king in that movie, you know, uh, with the there were two kings, you know, with Philip and you know, Louis and you know, okay, the, the Iron Mask, yeah, things. Uh, you know, you may think that you don't need to be rescued. You're the rescuer. But God's going to put you in a position that you can't get out of because he wants you to rely on him, not yourself. All of us are going to feel this. Moses looked at the people with fear written all over their faces and realized this fear thing had to be dealt with first. You got to deal with the fear now. And therefore he said, don't be afraid. Don't fear. People, you have a choice as to whether you allow fear to dominate you or not. You have a choice. But I was afraid. It's a choice. No, it's not. I feel afraid. So then don't feel afraid. The people of God had come to a place where they had to make a choice. Give up and go back to Egypt, to slavery, to the whip, or trust and obey God. That was the choice. We have the same choice today. We can either give up or we can obey God. The next thing Moses said was, stand still. Stand still. We have to be able to stand by faith before we can walk by faith. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You see, with waiting, and, and funny, we live in New York City. I mean, there's no waiting here. It's like everything is... I had a sandwich made. Uh, I, I like, uh, uh, happened to like um, uh, cheese, uh, uh, cheddar cheese, uh, with lettuce and tomato, salt and pepper, mayonnaise, a little bit of olive oil drizzled on there with a, you, know, you guys getting hungry? We, uh, on a uh, croissant. It's like one of my favorite sandwiches, right, to order. So, and, and I order in New York, so what do you want? And I tell them, and I barely finished with the order and the coffee and it's in front of me. Okay, you know, uh, you know, six ninety five, whatever they charge you next. And they're already making another breakfast order or lunch order. That fast, this is New York. A New York Minute, I think it's about 15 seconds. Anyway, and once I'm, I'm down south, I was in Alabama and ordered the same sandwich. First of all, they didn't even know what a croissant was at that place. And so I got, so you have white bread. They said, yes, yeah. so the lady starts making the sandwich for me. She walks down, she's got those slippers that like drag and she down the counter. And she comes all the way back with the bread, and gets a plate, puts it on the plate. What did you want on that? Cheddar cheese. I'm looking around like, is this for real? I was waiting for Al, Al Funt with the candid camera to jump out from the back of the room. I couldn't believe it. It was real. I had to wait. It was a dynamite sandwich. But it took her 25 minutes to make it with my goodness. She said, oh, you wanted coffee? Let me put a pot on for you. Never mind. A glass of milk. So, but with waiting comes renewed strength according to the Lord. With waiting comes renewed zeal. Some of us are lacking in our zeal, right? Remember when you first came to faith? Remember when you first believed how full you were of spirit and life? The eagerness in you to learn and soak up like a sponge everything you could. Yeah, if they said, we're going to meet for worship every day, and it was after working hours and you could make it, you'd be there every day. Yes. You're going to do three Bible studies a week, you're at every one. We're going to do this, you're going to be, uh, we're having an evening service, a morning service, and an afternoon service, you're at all of them. I know that some churches do four, ser for so four services a week. The Orthodox Jews go to three services every single day. Every day. What about Sunday? So, you know, there's four services. No, it's three services every day. You see, with waiting comes renewed strength, renewed zeal, and renewed faith. According to who? Isaiah the prophet who speaks the word of God. But they who wait for Adonai will renew their strength. They will soar up as with wings as eagles, on eagles. They will run and not grow weary. You won't get tired in your faith. They will walk and not be faint. You won't pass out. You won't, you won't, none of these things will happen because you're waiting on God, not on man. 
When we look to our faith and depend on El Shaddai, God who is all sufficient, mm -hmm. if we trust in him and look to our faith, he will strengthen our hearts. Amen. He'll strengthen our mind, our will, our emotions. We'll simply stand still and trust in his word. We'll simply stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. If we're willing to wait for him and know that he is God and know that he is our salvation, stand still and wait on him. And let God do what he does best. Stand still and watch God move for you. Stand still and look to your faith. He's telling us in Psalm 46 verse 10, be still and know that I am God. God never leaves nor forsakes us. Have faith that God will save you, that God will deliver you, that God will take you through that trouble, through that problem. It's all for a purpose, but it's his purpose. We don't understand why we're at the Red Sea. But God sees what's on the other side. How he's going to mold us and change us and make us stronger. To that most terrible time in my life. And years later, now I can minister to someone else. And they say, how could you understand what I'm going through? Because God took me through it. I went through that. How can you minister to me? How can you possibly understand that this person close to me just died? Because I've been there. How could you understand who I am and what I've been through? I've been released from prison because I've been there. I've been through it. God took me through it. How can you know what it's like to be a Jew and to come to faith and have your whole family just close the door on you and rip their clothes like you're dead? Because I've been there and lived through it. God molded me, strengthened me, gave me zeal, and gave me the fortitude to go on. God sees what's on the other side. He's brought you out in times past, whether you will recognize it or not. He's done it. He's led you by clouds in the day and fire by night. Have you food? He gave you food when you were hungry and drink when you were thirsty. Amen. Amen. Number three, the third thing you need to do to cross that Red Sea in your life is launch forward. The first thing was stop living in the past. Stop looking to the past. The second thing was look to your faith. The third thing is launch forward. Forward. This is verse 15 of Exodus 14. We've got to learn to go forward in the things of God. If you really want to go forward, you've got to learn how to move at his command. Our faith is like a plant. If it's not growing, it's dying. You ever hear that said about love between two people? If your love's not growing, it's dying. Faith is the same. If you're, if, how can you stay the same? You can't plateau. There is no plateau. Well, how, what's the maximum level of my faith? Standing before the Lord God Almighty and not being burnt to a crisp. Does that really happen? Yeah, read the book of Revelation. It really happens. For the first time in the history of the universe, we, the believers, will get to stand in the presence and glory in the face of the living God and not die. There won't be a sun or a lamp, but his glory will be the light for us. We've got to learn to move forward. We have to learn to go forward in God's presence. When I think about God's presence, I could talk about a lot of things from the Bible and tell you to be in God's presence. And I know you're not. I talk to people all week long, whether by email, text, they call me, they chat with me, some right here from this congregation and other people from various parts of the world who contact me with their issues. And you know what I don't hear in anything about their challenges? I don't hear anything about them being in God's presence. And I'm not talking about for two hours on a Saturday or a Sunday. I mean, they're just not in God's presence. Well, I really felt God's presence in the worship. Well, I'm glad you got your daily dose of God. Do you right now go back to Egypt? Now that you're done with your dose of God, you've got to have God's presence in your life. Let me tell you about God's presence, maybe a story that you wouldn't relate it to. You would think it's something else. It's God's glory. It's God's strength. It's God's miracle. But it's God's presence here that makes the difference. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, 
beginning in verse 32. We see a story of David and, oh, and Goliath. David is summoned. He's just a boy. He goes to King Saul and he says, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go up and fight him. And King Saul replied to him, You are not able to go in, out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man or boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, I want you to listen to what he says. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will not be like will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Amen. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. This is the presence of God in David's life and faith. How usually people think about the Bible, somebody besting a lion. We're thinking about somebody strong as Samson. Here's little David, a boy. Lion, psh, next. Bear, psh, next. What else you got? Okay. It's little boy David. You know why? He walked in the presence of the living God. You have the presence of God in your life. You can overcome that Red Sea. But it's the 31st, and tomorrow my rent is due, and there's nowhere in sight to get this money. It's just not going to happen. They're going to throw us out. Our family will be on the street. What are you going to do? Cry? Call the welfare department? Immediately get on your knees and pray. Fast and pray and ask for God's help. And someone is going to call. Someone is going to knock on the door. Aid will come. And guess what? Before they throw you out, you'll say, here's the money. Yeah. And the landlord goes, wait, I thought you guys were out of work and you had no job and there was no way to put it. I mean, we already had people looking at the place. We're going to rent it out next week. We prayed to our God. He saved us. He delivered us. Well, how? How did you do this? We were in his presence. You also have to learn to go forward in God's power. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. How could you say I can't do this when you can do it? And three, you've got to go forward in God's promise. Matthew 28 verse 20, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And remember, Yeshua says, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. For all of your life before you were born, after you're gone in the heavenly realm, he is with us. Just launch forward no matter what comes your way. The crossing of your Red Sea is for a purpose. And the other side of your faith, you may be stronger. Your song will be louder. Your prayer time more frequent. Closer to the Lord brought to your knees. People, please. When life gives you more than you can stand, kneel. You know, we tend to say the wrong things every single day. We tend to think this way. It gets into who we are. Really. That's the world. That's Egypt talking. It's not God talking. You know, we say it's impossible. And God says all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. We say I'm too tired. And God says I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. And we say, nobody really loves me. And God says, I love you, John 3, 16. And we say, nobody really cares for me. And God says, I care for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. And when we say, I can't go on, God says, my grace is sufficient for you, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When we say, I can't figure things out, and God says, I will direct your paths, Proverbs 3, 6. When we say, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And God says, you can do all things through me, Philippians 4.13. And when we say, I am unable, and God says, I am able, 2 Corinthians 9.8. And when we say, I am not worth it, God says, it will be worth it, Romans 8.28. And when we say, I can't forgive myself, and God says, I forgive you, 
1 John 1.9. And when we say, I can't afford to, God says, I will supply all your needs. Philippians 4.19. Stop thinking that everything's impossible when we serve the God of the impossible. He split the Red Sea and millions of Hebrews and other people from different countries who followed them as a mixed multitude passed through the sea with the greatest army the world had ever known on their tail. Their death was imminent and it was sure as the sun rose in the morning. And God stepped in with a pillar of fire and said, you stay right there, Egypt. I'm not done with you. I'm getting towards the end of my sermon and I know it's long, but I felt this is what God wanted me to say today. It wasn't my first sermon and it wasn't my second. By the way, that first one was pretty good. <laughs> There's a story about an old farmer whose mule fell into a well. And after many unsuccessful attempts to hold the mule out of the hole, the old farmer decided it was hopeless, couldn't do it. And with sadness, he instructed his boys to fill up several truckloads of dirt and just pour the dirt into the well to bury the old mule right in the well. And the boys packed up the truck and filled with dirt and shovel by shovel, they began to fill the well and bury the mule. And the mule didn't take kindly to this action. The first shovel of dirt hit him square in the head, got in his eyes and his mouth, and it made him sneeze. And every shovel full after that hit him somewhere, causing the old mule to stomp around at the bottom of the well. Man! Several truckloads of dirt later, the mule was still stomping and packing dirt firmly underneath his feet. Little by little, that mule, stubborn as he was, was lifting itself out of the hole. The more dirt they pulled in, the more he shook off and stepped on it and kept getting higher and higher in the well. Sure enough, about mid-afternoon, that mule simply stepped out of the well and snorted at the whole business. There are different ways people have of dealing with problems life throws at you. Some are constant complainers. They don't handle setbacks and upsets very well. Some of them cannot even handle normal events. Others are defeated at the slightest difficulty. Quite a few get confused, turned around, and seem not to know what to do. And there are a few who are unconquerable. They are like the mule. Problems can hit them square on the head, but they just stomp around enough until they actually use the problem and rise above it. Look at the great heroes of the Bible. They were men and women who could match the occasion. Moses was that kind of man. Surely Joseph who rose from the bottom of a pit to a leader of Egypt was that kind of man. Could David have been anything other than the kind of man who rose above his faults and problems? Esther was surely that kind of woman who did not let problems paralyze her. On and on we could go, but you see the point. How was all this done? The reason such people could rise above, to rise out of the wells of life, is because they all had great faith in God. That's the common denominator between them. Great faith in God. It is a childish attitude in our day that says, if God loved me, he would take away all these problems. Not so. That's not God. The opposite is really true. If God loves you, he will reveal himself to you through his word and give you the opportunity to let your faith be lifted up. As you go through these problems and challenges, he is saying, I want Pharaoh in Egypt to know that I am the Lord your salvation, to be still and wait on me. God wants us to learn how to do it. He wants us to work it. When you realize and accept it, that it will give you power to deal with living like you never had before. And I want you to see in closing that coming to the Red Sea is just as much a part of God's plan as crossing it. Coming to the Red Sea is just as much a part of God's plan as crossing it. A predicament in God's hands is only a highway to the promised land. I got this predicament right now. I got this problem right now. You're on your way to the promised land. Maintain your faith. Be still and wait on him and the salvation of the Lord. Why does God allow these predicaments to happen in our lives? Oftentimes it takes these tight places to get us to look up at him for help. Otherwise, we begin to rely on ourselves. We drift away from the Lord. You want to see a record of my people doing that? Read the Bible. 
constantly. Oh, God, you're the greatest thing. Oh, yeah, we love you. Oh, you're the best. And then a few years later, God who? Doing their own thing. Then he puts them through the muck and mire. Then they, he helps them rise above it. And then they believe in him again. They worship him again. We cannot cross the Red Sea on our own strength, people. There is no way. God will part the waters for us. There's a poem as I get close to my ending that says, I shall meet tomorrow bravely. I am stronger now. The disappointments that befell me strengthened me somehow. The dawn shall find my place uplifted, serene in the sun. And with him, my problems sifted one by one. And as we ponder the song of Moses and Israel that they sang in, at the sea in that day long ago, we can feel with them, those ancient Israelites, we feel with them, then and now we feel God. Revelation 15 Verses 1 to 4 refers to the song of Moses, and it says, I saw another great and marvelous sign in the sky, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them God's wrath is finished. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who overcame the beast, his image, and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And they were singing, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who wouldn't fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. Let these words, the words of God, strengthen us and see us through each day ahead. That as we be still, as we wait on the Lord, knowing that He is our salvation. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.